Today on The Future of Everything, The Future of Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, or PTSD. Since really ancient times, we have known that people who suffer traumatic experiences uh, also continue to suffer after these events, and sometimes for a prolonged period of time. In World War I, returning soldiers had a syndrome, syndrome that was referred to as shell shock, characterized by upsetting uh, and sometimes vivid memories of the trauma, flashbacks, nightmares, those kinds of things, feeling on edge, trouble sleeping, anxiety, depression, emotional numbness uh, in the sense of like a muted response to emotional situations, maybe even avoidance of people, places, and activities that remind the sufferer of the original trauma. Similar syndromes have been described not only for soldiers returning from battle, but victims of violent crimes, uh, including sex crimes. But it's not an ancient disease. And in fact, this came more to the public awareness with the return of Vietnam vets and public awareness of sex crimes where uh, the victims were just not getting better. Um, as a trainee in medicine, I was introduced in my training at the Veterans Administration Hospital to vets who had these symptoms and were seeking help. Uh, and it was clear that it could be incapacitating and it wasn't always obvious how to best treat them. Dr. Shelley Jane is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford University, and she specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of PTSD. She has written a book entitled The Unspeakable Mind, which provides moving examples of people with PTSD, as well as the scientific basis for our understanding of it and strategies for tr treatment and prevention. Shelley, how did you get interested in PTSD? And can you review for me the key clinical features for people who are not familiar with it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how did I get interested? A little a bit of a personal story in that I was a psychiatrist in private practice in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, my parents were visiting from England where I was born and raised. And we, we went on this road trip. And in essence, during this road trip, it was it was a trip to celebrate my dad's 70th birthday. Um, he kind of reminded me uh, of his own background. He was a trauma survivor. He was a war orphan, a refugee, a child laborer. Um, he was born and raised in India um, during the 1947 partition of British India. Uh, you know, as, as a young man, he ended up moving to England, and that was where I was born and raised, and that was the only world I ever knew. But I think getting that reminder of my own family trauma mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. was just uh, really moving for me and made me think um, I should think about what I wanted to do with my career. And so that's when I decided to move and uh, specialize to become a PTSD specialist yes. and a trauma scientist. You were scientist. already a psychiatrist? Yes, I was already a psychiatrist. So clearly on some level, <laughs> I'd made it there. But uh, that was like the final, final thing that, you know, okay, we as physicians, we have this great platform. We, yes. We're so educated. So what was I going to commit my career to? And, and so that's where I am today, kind of, you know, more than 10 years later. And now I tried to characterize the disease in my own rough mm -hmm. way, but I wanted to make sure that I got it right or there are features that you might like to uh, stress that are... Um, perhaps underappreciated or, or, or people don't un understand how complex this, this disorder might be. So, I mean, that was a, a great characterization. So it's famous for the nightmares, the flashbacks, the, the, the high uh, exaggerated startle reaction. Lesser known is how it impacts a life more insidiously, the emotional um, numbing, you know, the muted capacity to love and how it leaves the the sufferer on this perpetual verge of alienation from the world and everybody around them. So it, it really insidiously infiltrates the way people love, the way they work, the way they play, the way they, they create. And I think that is what's a little more difficult to put your finger on. And certainly in the last 20 years, so much has happened in the science of PTSD in the last 20 years. But one other thing that's becoming really, really apparent is it goes beyond mind and brain. It uh -huh. infiltrates bodily organs, bodily systems. Um, it's emerged as an independent risk factor for heart disease. You know, it's implicated in major conditions like obesity and cancer. So I, th I think we're just discovering more and more about PTSD and how it's this kind of whole bodily system condition. Yeah, and in that way, it's a great model for reminding us about the connection. I mean, this is obvious. Yeah. The connection between the mind and the body is real. Yes. And has real uh, repercussions when there's a, a, a disharmony of any kind. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, is it true? I, I think I've read that 
the onset of symptoms can be rapid after the trauma or can be delayed. And I don't know if that's a folk myth and if actually these people are showing signs and symptoms right away. Or how true is it that the onset of the disease may be very delayed versus immediate? It is true. And that's what makes it really perplexing, right? Because there's no way I can predict how any one individual huh. is going to respond to a traumatic event because there's a multitude of factors that determines our trauma responses, a third of which can be explained by genetics, by the way. Literally how our brain is wired and how our body minds are And response. so there are, there are clear genetic components. Uh, we don't have it identified on a marker level. Like uh -huh. I cannot tell you which gene, but there is a huge heritable component. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have no way of predicting. I would say the majority of cases you can say, okay, it is normal to have this reaction in the first, you know, hours, days after a trauma. If it hasn't disappeared by a month, you're thinking, is this PTSD? This delayed onset pattern is there. It, I would say it's probably less common. And is it also true that, I mean, I think it's, it, it's, it seems to me obvious that trauma is in the eyes of the sufferer. And mm -hmm. that um, there, and so I'm wondering, are there, is the magnitude of the trauma from some objective uh, measure, like, well, you know, a terrible war situation versus a personal trauma, does that matter? Or is it really how it's experienced by the sufferer? So it's both. So dose really matters, okay. right? We, we've all got our limits, you know, so we've seen these in studies with veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, the more deployments they have, their odds of PTSD go up. Ah. So there is a dose response curve. Uh, but at the same time, you're right, it's a very personalized thing too. Uh, you know, someone, you know, you, you take three people who survive a terrorist attack, all three will have different reactions to the same situation, even though their lives were all threatened in the same way, they right. probably witnessed pretty similar things. So, it, so it's both. And a lot of it is the history they bring to that trauma. If this is somebody who had a horrible childhood history of trauma, maybe they were assaulted in their 20s and in their 40s, they experienced a terrorist attack, very different to someone who may have never experienced experienced trauma before. So there's this yes. cumulative effect that we often don't know, right. you know, and, and that all plays a role. When you say we often don't know, do you mean we, the physicians trying to help or even the, the uh, sufferers, patients themselves? Both again. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, just, just, just understanding that people come to a particular situation with a background and a history and we have to make ourselves aware of that as the physician, but also sometimes patients because denial and avoidance, like you say, is a big part of trauma. Oftentimes I'll meet people who significant things happen to them in their early life, but they kind of figured out a way to manage or cope yes. and they patched together a way of doing things. And it was kind of sort of working, but then something major will hit and that's it. The whole house of cards comes strong, coming down, uh, comes falling down and then they have to kind of go backwards and reconcile all of it yes. to make sense of it. Yes. So very helpful. So h how good are we at identifying these patients and getting them into the system for help? Yeah. Um, so I, I think I'm. some places are better than others. Mm -hmm. and, and as we were talking earlier, I think the VA, for many reasons, A, it's a population health model, B, because it serves veterans, has PTSD on the radar. You know, people who care about PTSD have a seat at the table when it comes to that organization. Right. So it's kind of part of our culture that we think about it, we ask about it, we know what to do when we see it. I am afraid the same is not true outside the VA. I think we're still struggling. Uh, you know, I, th I think PTSD is still really tough to diagnose. It's still challenging to treat. And I think the average clinician is still not where we need to be in terms of awareness of PTSD, just how common it is that it goes far beyond the horrors of war. This is the future of everything. I'm speaking with Shelley Jane about uh, PTSD and, and capturing it. And, and I want to just follow up on that in the community. Uh, you said that there was a comorbidity with many other more common things like heart disease. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine that there might be many people out in the, in the world who are not vets and therefore whose providers might not be thinking about this at the tip of their tongue. Mm -hmm. And they're treating the heart disease or they're treating the cancer mm -hmm. or even depression and mm -hmm. anxiety. And there's never that moment to step back and say, wait a minute, can we tie all of this together mm -hmm. with this uh, with this diagnosis? Yeah. So I'm sure that there are probably cryptic uh, hidden cases yeah. out in the community. Absolutely. Uh, and it pro so would it be useful, and I guess this is the obvious question, 
how useful would it be for a, for a primary care physician to make the diagnosis of PTSD, and how might it change their treatment of a patient who otherwise they're trying to individually manage depression, anxiety, and, and other problems? I mean, it would be huge, hugely useful. You know, name it so we can tame it, right? right. Uh, if, we, if we don't get the diagnosis right, our whole conceptualization yes. is prone to errors. And I would say with PTSD, it's really important you get it right, because these patients have got really, really complicated histories that seep into everything. So even if you look like adherence to dietary advice or advice about exercise. We know people with PTSD are not good at being adherent. Right. You know, they're, they're, it's much harder for them to quit smoking. It's much harder than for them to eat, right? So if you don't factor that in as part of your kind of counseling and the way you kind of predict how they're going to respond, you're going to be frustrated. You're not yes. going to understand. Yes. So so it's hugely important. I, I feel like it's, it's very under-recognized, and I think that causes a lot of problems. So I know, one of the th great things about your book is it's filled with these personal stories where people can see, and I, and we can't do that here, but I would love for you to paint a picture of like a patient and a kind of a, a situation that you've faced so that just so that the people who are listening have an idea of how these things come to you mm -hmm. and what the challenges are in treating them and in helping make the diagnosis and the patient response to the diagnosis. Is there a story you can tell us? So uh, uh, I guess the first thing that comes Real to mind is just speaking. Yeah, it's a kind of a, like a composite type scenario that I think is relevant to a lot of people, especially people who aren't yes. psychiatrists, maybe internists. Is sometimes I meet people, the last person they want to meet is someone like me, you uh -huh. know, because the last thing they want to do is talk about the trauma and face the trauma. And that is the inherent to the condition called PTSD, this kind of pathological avoidance and denial. So oftentimes you have people, and definitely see that in the veteran community, definitely see with older veterans, who've constructed a whole life where they have avoided that trauma. And um, the problem is it's a very constricted life. Yeah. You know, so emotionally they might be estranged and cut off from loved ones. Um, they've led an isolated existence. Um, you know, they've really not bloomed and lived the full life that they deserved and they were entitled to. And oftentimes where they hit issues is when they run into medical problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have a stroke or, you know, they have some complication of diabetes where they're forced to be dependent on other people, where they have to show up for doctor ah. appointments, where they're no longer in control. People are poking and prodding at them, telling them they need to get this test and that so test. So the walls that they've built up no come longer crashing work. down. And what you see is people who are irritable. They they're, um, they're, uh, they fly off the handle. They they're difficult, you yes. know, quote unquote. Um, a lot of anxiety, intense anxiety. And you know, if you've got to the age of 50, 60, 70, and you've never really learned a way to verbalize what you're feeling in terms of anxiety, you can really get into issues, yes. you know. And then it really hits at that at that intersection between receiving your medical care and having good outcomes from your medical yes. issues. Yes. Um, so oftentimes that's when someone like me gets bought in where they're like, okay, something's going on. We don't know what's going on. And then that's where you have to have these really, you know, delicate conversations with people and really skirt around old wounds that they might not want to open, but time is of the essence. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Shelly Jane about PTSD, and I definitely want to get to current treatment and prevention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But before that, tell me, tell us a little bit about where the science is. What what do we understand about this disorder? Is it related to other disorders that are more familiar? I mean, mm -hmm. is it is it a, a a type of depression? Is it a type of anxiety? Is it its mm -hmm. own thing? Mm -hmm. Just a, and and what do we understand about the molecular or scientific neural basis of these of these responses? Um, so the last 20 years, huge growth in the science of PTSD because of world events like 9-11 and wars in Iraq and Unfortunately, Afghanistan. The, yeah. Unfortunately, but this huge body of evidence that continued to grow exponentially, it's definitely its own thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's actually earned its own category, trauma and stress-related disorders. But PTSD really lives alone. It goes hand in hand with depression, anxiety, addiction. So you're rarely going to see it by itself. Mm -hmm. So clinically, just to be aware that it, it doesn't live alone. And in terms of its biological basis, you know, we're still in our infancy. It's almost like as soon as I start talking about it, I know that <laughs> it's probably outdated. Even depression and bipolar disorder and Everything. schizophrenia yes. are at the very early stages. Exactly. Just because the tools with which we probe these things are evolving and changing and how we interpret things. But, you know, we do know this certain sense systems that are implicated. So we know the hippocampus, for example, mm -hmm. that's smaller in people who have PTSD. That's the part of our brain that processes memory. Um, we don't know why. We don't know if they pre-existingly had I a small see. hippocampus. So if it's a cause or an effect. Or we don't know that yet, but we do 
know that it is smaller. We know that the amygdala, you know, the part of our brain that responds to fear and anger, um, that is out of control in people who have PTSD. They're very quick to react, and that explains why they can go from zero to 100 in less than a second. So a lot of times they'll see danger where danger doesn't exist, you know. And it can be traced to these specific brain regions that deal with danger. Yes. Right. So you said something about uh, there's strong evidence in general for genetic that like if, if your relatives have yes. a, have had a higher risk. And that seems to be to me to be particularly difficult because so much of genetics co-occurs with cultural. Yes. So so, you know, it's possible that my mom and dad had the same traumas that I had, be, yep. depending on where we're living in the world. Yeah. So I'm sure that it's very difficult to separate out Absolutely. the cultural influences from the underlying biological influences. Yeah. But to, nonetheless, uh, yeah. the, the evidence seems to show. Yeah. So there's been a lot of work done in the area of epigenetics literally in the last 20 years. And you're right. Conventionally, that's the way we used to see it, that it was all like learned behaviors or, right. you know, um, uh, your environment. Environment, but uh, some interesting work done by Rachel Yehuda, who's a neuroscientist out of Mount Sinai, where she followed moms who were pregnant during 9-11 uh -huh. and who escaped the Twin Towers. Whoa. And she followed these moms and she followed their offspring uh, using uh, the biomark of salivary cortisol. And there is this very early, really, really early, we're just not there yet, uh, you know, but really early in evidence to indicate epigenetic mechanisms are at play. So if you're someone who experienced trauma, who are living with PTSD, it's going to influence which genes are switched on and which, which genes are switched off, and you're going to pass those changes on. I see. So they're looking at whether these moms got PTSD yep. and also whether their unborn children yep. uh, had something passed on. Yes. That's what the study of epigenetics yes, is. Exactly. That gives them an increased risk. Yes. Even the though future. these kids themselves didn't experience a trauma per se, you know. And that to me is fascinating because I think when you think of mass traumatization, right, when you think of slavery, when you think of genocide, when you think of Holocaust, you can't help get this sense of the deep footprint that PTSD might be leaving through these generations. Yes, and that that is a cause for pause. Yeah, <laughs> just thinking right? about just what you just said yeah. is uh, because that means the things that happened 30, 50, 70 years ago Still are affecting the biology of people yes. today. Yes. Um, now, and at the same time, and you referred to this a couple times in our conversation, there are people who've had terrible trauma for whom this doesn't seem to manifest. Yeah. And so it seems that they're also a resource to, to try to understand what it was about either their biology or, as you said before, their previous life. What particular things might have been helpful to help them not get the disorder? Yeah. To me, I mean, there's so many factors that go into resilience. It's such a complicated construct, the concept yes. of resilience. But to me, I, I kind of see myself as a social psychiatrist. What comes through loud and clear is you cannot under underestimate the power of a positive social network, mm -hmm. right? So if you come from a community that is resilient, that has got resources, that rallies around you after a trauma, that in itself is going to prevent you from developing PTSD. Or if you do develop PTSD, your symptoms will resolve faster. Very remarkable. This yeah. is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Dr. Shelley Jane uh, about PTSD, and we're going to get to treatments and prevention next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Dr. Shelley Jane about PTSD, and I'd like to get to prevention and treatment. Uh, but prevention is the one that I'm really interested in because the the, the kind of Initial response would be, well, how are you going to ever really prevent a trauma? Nobody goes into a trauma on purpose. Right. So, of course, you're going to tell us, please avoid trauma. But I think there might be more to it than that. So yeah. what, what, where are we with prevention? So I, I think the future of PTSD is in prevention because we have, as you know, a, a massive lack of mental health professionals. There's just no way we're going to train up enough people to meet the need. And the way I like to think about prevention is on three levels, like primary, tertiary, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Okay. And so primary prevention, you know, you've heard about all this, you know, like the violence prevention programs, you know, self-defense programs, yes. you know. So if you think about like uh, violent assault or sexual assault, like, you know, if we could prevent those, yes. you know, then obviously we'd have less PTSD. And a big chunk of PTSD comes from crimes like that. Right, right. Um, 
I think what's exciting now that was missing from years before is I think we've got a lot more precise about prevention. So, you know, there's a lot of do-gooders before, like coming up with these programs and just assuming they're helping people, but no one was measuring Kind of outcomes. unvalidated. Unvalidated. And then that's when you get into trouble and then people aren't going to fund your causes because you, you have no proof that what you're doing is really yes, working. Just because yes. you feel like it's working doesn't mean it's working. So I think what's really cool now is that people are taking the time. And a lot of this is because of the sophisticated statistical model modeling that we have now that maybe we didn't have years ago, we can actually pinpoint the details of what is working in a program. Mm -hmm. Like what is the secret source ingredients? What really works? Say, how do you train women to defend themselves effectively from violent attackers? What is the secret source ingredient? And if we know what the secret source ingredient is, we can scale and replicate those programs. Right. You know, so there's some really great work being done in that regard. Not enough in my mind. We need a lot more money behind these type of efforts, but that is exciting to me. Yes, and, and you can imagine, you know, they have all these kids programs for drug abuse and, and violence. And yep. this could actually be inculcated into children yep. at, appropriately without yep. scaring them. Sure. But right. but but also empowering them to to think about this yeah. and be, be positioned to handle situations. Absolutely. In the future. Preparing them. And, and, and if we can do so in a way that's effective, I think okay. is a worthwhile investment. So that's investment. what we will call primary. Yeah, because you're, 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 they're not even, you know, they're, 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 they're limiting the amount of trauma they're exposed yes. to. Secondary uh, prevention is really exciting for me because there's something about that PTSD construct, right? There's a very clear before and after, which is very unusual for mental health conditions. There's a before the trauma. The triggers. And, yeah, yes. there's a before the trauma and there's an after. So is there this opportunity where we uh. can intervene between when someone's exposed to trauma and before they develop PTSD? Because right. there is this window Right. We call it the golden hours in my field. What about if we intervened then to prevent the onset of PTSD? I see. And part of that is moving where we meet trauma survivors. Part of that is showing up in emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, not waiting for the weeks, months, years later when they show up in the office of someone right. like me. Right. So we're not only going to tend to their physical elements, but yep. there's an opportunity here to do something. You'll yes. tell me what it is right. right now to try to minimize the chances of PTSD. Absolutely. So the same algorithmic way we might prevent a stroke or a heart attack or intervene early. You know. So what might you do? So there's some early research done, there's a group out of Atlanta Emory University that modified um, a psychological treatment for PTSD and packaged it in a way that you can deliver it to trauma survivors right there in the ER. They did some RCTs to show that... Randomized the, control, control trials. trials. Yeah, the, who, that whoever got that modified prolonged exposure intervention compared to the ones who didn't, they ended up having less PTSD Okay, symptoms. so this is a validated yeah. maneuver. Yes, right. Um, so that's one example cortisol you know there's some studies done with patients in the ICU that the because a lot of people develop PTSD after being in the ICU yes. um, the, the patients who got like IV hydrocortisone uh, had less PTSD symptoms you know compared to the ones who didn't so again early stuff but really encouraging right, right? that if we hit it early we can prevent it, you know those situations are still traumatizing for people and it does make some intuitive sense that there is a there is a the brain is has been traumatized right. and you and in the same way that you can help the body improve its chances of healing there it makes sense that there would be things to help the brain yeah. heal right. uh, more quickly and therefore not have the long-term scars Cycle, and yeah. i'm using analogies right. here absolutely so it's just the same way we would approach physical illness let, let's approach the psychological wounds right is this there. part of your practice the secondary interventions do you get called to emergency rooms to try to administer or is that not yet a standard yeah. of it's care it's not prime time not ready as a standard of care now what is is tertiary prevention okay so Probably let's the move least, to tertiary yeah. Yeah, least glamorous, but uh, lowest hanging fruit. So an example would be integrated care, right? So 10 years ago, I ditched my regular psychiatrist office, which was in a mental health care a clinic, of course, on a different campus from the regular hospital, which yeah. seems to be... Right the way it's always yeah psychiatry departments are all over the world um so i ditched it and i moved my practice to primary care so i sit in primary care um and why do i do that because guess what people with mental health disorders they show up in primary care they don't show up a, a lot of them will drop off before yes. they show up up in specialty mental health yes. um so uh reaching people earlier by the psychiatrist changing their location that we know works Okay. There's a lot of data to support that model. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and we're speaking with Dr. Shelley Jane now about tertiary prevention and then uh, treatment. So, so this is uh, the early. Uh, so, uh, whereas secondary was the trauma has occurred, and before we even even worry about the diagnosis, we're going to start doing some things. Tertiary, the diagnosis is now 
manifest but maybe not recognized by the the healthcare system right. and but and but using these uh, interventions such as having real life psychiatrists in the primary care yep. suite we have a better chance of picking these people up and Pick getting them, them into what I now want to talk about which is what are our treatment uh, is this uh, is this uh, psychoanalytical type things mm-hmm. or is it drugs or is it both where are we in treatment so um, the good news is what was once an incurable disabling condition PTSD it's today really, really treatable because we've come so far in what we can offer folks. The first line standard of treatment is talk therapies, Um, uh, typically trauma-focused psychotherapies, things like prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy, EMDR. Those are I, the, I don't know yeah. those letters. So uh, EMDR. Yeah. So it's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. <laughs> so oh. It's a bit of a mouthful. So, uh, and then the others I had spelled out. So um, the trauma-focused psychotherapies in that integral to these psychotherapies is a focus on that trauma uh-huh. and, and dismantling that trauma and helping the patient get past that trauma. They, they've got the biggest body of evidence to support their effectiveness, so that is really first-line treatment. And some of the indicators of success might be whereas a patient was closed down and was unwilling to discuss, you now see signs that they're willing to discuss it without their blood pressure going up, without their heart rate going up, that they've, they've come to peace with discussing this event without having it be a huge emotional and physical reaction and you can actually measure that I would guess yes absolutely you can and integral to these treatments is these exposure exercises I mean part of the problem with PTSD is when the person is confronted with reminders of the trigger their body's responses go out of control like you said so part of it is helping them recognize triggers giving them tools and strategies and and coping mechanisms to handle that response. Yes. So so they're back in the driver's seat of their right. life. That's what I always say to patients. Right now, the trauma's in charge of you. You'll be back in the driver's very seat. Very attractive. I mean, that's yep. a great thing to say. I can imagine that would be a, a very attractive model for a patient. To help people. You know, they're never going to forget the hope. trauma. They're not going to forget it. It's going to leave them forever changed. But it doesn't have to derail their life the way it is. Yeah. Great. So is the, there a role for drugs? Yes, absolutely. Medications, for, um, the, 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 the type of medications you might want to use first are the SSRIs or SNRIs, commonly known as antidepressant medications. Yes. Prozac and yeah. Friends. Yeah, two, of, two have a FDA indication. That would be sertraline and paroxetine. They actually okay. have an FDA indication for PTSD. And I think there's, in, uh, you know, a, a month doesn't go by when I don't see someone have a life-altering transformation on medicine, uh, on these type of medications. Is this usually done after the cognitive approaches have been gun or is it contemporaneous with the cognitive talk therapies how about how does timing usually yeah. work usually i want people to do therapy first because okay. a lot of people have a great response obviously that doesn't always happen for a multitude of reasons then meds is a second line option so in addition to the antidepressants are there other a group uh, the one i'm wondering about are beta blockers yeah only because they're sometimes used for people who have performance anxiety which i understand is very different yeah but it keeps your heart rate down it stops the flight or fright response yeah does that have any role there was some early evidence to suggest a role for beta blockers in that secondary prevention mm-hmm. that i talked about i don't think it really panned out in the the, the bigger trials uh, one thing we know not to use that does not help people with ptsd that can be harmful are benzodiazepines I was going to ask about those as well, yeah. which have also addictive potential. Definitely addictive potential, but also it's almost like they kick the can down the road. They, they don't they delay the, the recovery. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Because they actually uh, dampen down some of the responses that people need to actually get better. Plus long term side effects in terms of falls and memory issues. Just not a good choice. So um, so this is really great news because we've heard about prevention uh, yeah. being a, not a random thing, but actually a very rational thing. And then the treatments you've described, both the talk therapies and the medications, it sounds like there's emerging evidence that these really are working. And as yeah. you've said, you've seen miraculous turnarounds. Yes, yeah. Well, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.